Hello everyone. As some of you may have already figured out, YouTube recently terminated my channel again. Like the last time, YouTube gave me no warning, no reason, and no right of appeal. I'm guessing it was all the vulgarity and adult situations on my channel. <laughs> of course, they can't beat me with intellect, reason, and logic, and so they resort to ignominious censorship. Government-mandated censorship through quasi-public forums hidden behind the corporate facade. It's clever. But I won't let it get me down because I'm starting over today with Taboo Conspiracy 3 with zero subscribers. Who knows, maybe I can get my wife to subscribe. Interestingly, my Taboo Conspiracy email isn't working either, and so you'll have to email me at tabooconspiracyii at gmail.com if you'd like to get in touch with me. Because of all of this censorship, I have decided to become an advocate for the globe today. I'm thinking that if I start promoting the globe, YouTube will stop deleting my channel. Makes sense, right? So that's what I'm going to do. Of course, I have to set aside all independent thought and parrot my programming. But that should be pretty easy because everyone knows that intelligence is based on how well you repeat your indoctrination. I think it was Aristotle who said, It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to accept your indoctrination without questioning it. Or something like that. But unlike your typical YouTube globe defender, I'm not going to call flat earthers names and make endless appeals to authority. Although those are still our best proofs of the globe. I am here to again address the fact that because of flat earthers, we have made many fascinating scientific, historical, and other discoveries in order to prop up the heliocentric model. I believe that globe enthusiasts like me need to first recognize and embrace these achievements that are due to the flat earthers in order for us to bridge this growing divide between those who seek truth and those who are paid to maintain the globe status quo. Discovery number one, the horizons metamorphosis. We globe earthers have had it wrong for thousands of years. There is no geometric horizon. And those crazy flat earthers were the only ones to figure it out. What is a horizon? It's actually a good question. Well, we globe supporters used to think that it was the point of the geometric earth that began obstructing distant objects, like in this diagram. Or in other words, the physical, visible, tangent point of the globe where the sky and the ground meet in the distance. But we globies were wrong. In order to defend the globe from these many flat earth horizon issues, and what is commonly known as the black swan, we globe earthers have now discovered that there are multiple horizons on our globe, and the horizon morphs and flattens out when people actually try to film and test the shape of the earth. Look at this video, for example. For this video, the cameraman BMLS B69 was at an elevation of 105 feet. There are three oil platforms he's filming. The closest one is at 10.9 miles. The second is at 21.9 miles. The third is at 26.4 miles. From that elevation, the horizon line could not be further than 12.5 miles. In other words, under the globe model, the horizon should appear in front of the second platform. And 58 feet of that second platform should be hidden behind the Earth's curvature. As you can see, the horizon is not only beyond the second platform. The horizon is beyond the third platform, further than 26.44 miles. In addition, 129 feet of the third platform should have been hidden below the horizon. But not even an inch of the platform is obstructed. We know this since the horizon is beyond the third platform. Somehow... The bulge of water selectively disappeared from in front of the second platform and then reappeared well beyond the third platform. But what's so awesome is that this earth bulge disappeared and then reappeared without affecting the objects in the middle, which remain inviolate on the visibly flat water. Obviously, flat earthers have discovered a problem with the previously understood globe model because the curvature of the earth should have been blocking two of these distant oil platforms in varying large amounts, but it isn't. Because of flat earthers, we globe earthers have had to invent the notion that the bulge over the earth can disappear and reappear anywhere, and the curvature in the horizon have absolutely no relation to the radius of the earth, and this is all due to the magical properties of refraction. As another example, look at this video from Grota1, where he placed colored lights at between 5 to 8 miles away from his camera. That red light was 8 miles from the camera. 
The camera was at a height of one foot. Based on the globe math, the horizon should be no further than 1.26 miles, and that red light should be 29 feet below the horizon. Instead, all of those lights are all on the same horizontal line when they should all be hidden behind the curvature, but there's no visible earth bulge anywhere. Mother Nature has simply removed all evidence of curvature on this frozen lake and presented all of the lights on the same horizontal plane. Pretty amazing how Mother Nature can do that. Maybe the more interesting question is why does Mother Nature repeatedly remove the Earth's curvature? But it's a fact that nature is hell-bent in tricking us and believing a flat Earth, but we globe enthusiasts are way too smart to fall for nature's flat Earth schemes. Which brings us to discovery number two. We see too far, but that's okay. Before flat Earth, no one ever knew that the Earth curved away at a huge 8 inches per mile squared. No one ever thought about the fact that we can see too far until flat earthers showed up with their high zoom cameras. Now flat earthers have hundreds of videos showing boats, buildings, lasers, mirror flashes, and many other things that should be well hidden behind the Earth's curvature, but they're not. Look at this footage from Sleeping Warrior. He's filming a, a lighthouse that was 31.4 miles away from the camera. The focal height of the lighthouse was 213 feet, but under the glow math, 587 feet should have been hidden. The light of the lighthouse should have been 374 feet below that horizon. But there's the light. It's certainly not hidden behind a wall of water. The wall of water must be invisible. Check out this laser test from Level Headed. The laser was 13.7 miles from the camera, and the laser source should have been hidden 107 feet below the horizon. As you can see, the wall of water that should be obstructing the laser has disappeared as the camera seemingly has a direct line of sight with the laser. Wide Awake alone has dozens of observations that are mathematically impossible under the globe. This channel marker is called Cutter Rock, and it was 11 miles away from the camera, and the top of it should have been 26 feet below the horizon, but the horizon seems to be beyond the marker, and so none of Cutter Rock is being hidden behind a curvature. Look at this laser here. It's 16.42 miles away, and yet you can see the source. 130 feet should have been hidden behind the curvature. There are so many tests like this. We, globe earthers, start with the unquestionable presupposition that we live on a globe, but the flat earth evidence seems overwhelming at times. Mother Nature somehow makes these huge mountains of curvature disappear and present a flat earth to us because that's what Mother Nature does. Pretty amazing, right? Look at this huge cruise ship. It should be entirely hidden by the curvature, but there it is. Sometimes we globe earthers get too caught up in defending our sacred globe that we forget the amazing fact that Mother Nature and billions of years of evolution have somehow created an optically flat environment, and it took flat earthers to figure out that mysterious fact. Kudos to flat earth. Discovery number three. The military has it all wrong. Because flat earthers discover that we see too far, and of course we globe supporters start with our sacrosanct presupposition that the earth is globe, then we know through basic circular logic that these distant bolts have to be mirages. However, you can't perceive or detect the mirage in any manner. You're not actually looking at a boat. You're actually looking at a mirage. There's actually a 100-foot globe bulge in front of that boat. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. But no military manual explains the fact that long-distance targets like these are mirages and are actually blocked by giant walls of curvature. Let me make this clear. Even though you can see the boat, there is no direct line of sight. There's an invisible, massive bulge of water blocking this far-distant boat. But look at this closer boat. It's not a mirage. Mirage? Not a mirage. They look very similar, but one is hiding behind a massive but invisible bulge of water. Accordingly, one cannot simply put crosshairs and theoretically shoot the distant boat, or you'll hit the 100-foot tall bulge of curved water that is actually blocking the boat. Think of how many battles were lost with Navy ships shooting bulges of water in front of mirages. Flat earthers have changed military manuals forever because there is no way of determining whether these boats are mirages except by using the globe curvature calculation of 8 inches per mile squared. 
Of course, you can use a calculator like this one, but every sailor, sniper, and artilleryman must now calculate the amount hidden behind the curvature before shooting. Otherwise, they risk targeting a mirage, which could result in disaster. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. Discovery number four. The railgun is useless at far distances. According to this popular mechanics article, the railgun has a range of 126 miles. Well, that can't be true. Flat Earthers discovered that all of those billions invested by the Navy on development of railguns was wasted because the curvature of the Earth would block the projectile. For example, at a height of 50 feet at 126 miles, there should be a target hidden height of 9,180 feet. That's a massive wall in front of your target, and the fast-moving projectile would simply hit the bolts or fly over the distant object because it's hidden. I'm certainly glad that the Flat Earthers put an end to that military boondoggle because those idiot engineers forgot to account for the curvature. Discovery number five. No acoustic globe shadow. For many years, sonar technicians in navies around the world used sonar sound waves for targeting objects under the water. But these sound waves also create what is called an acoustic shadow that looks like this. These acoustic shadows are well known in the sonar world because submarines can hide in these acoustic shadows to hide from sonar detection. These sonar acoustic shadows are very accurate and are also used for mapping and locating objects underwater. Well, guess what? According to a flat earth sonar expert, which has not been challenged by anyone, the globe does not create an acoustic shadow ever. In some way, the globe avoids all detection from sonar waves. How about that discovery? Mother Nature somehow prevents sonar waves from detecting the Earth's curvature. Likewise, humpback whales can supposedly communicate at a distance over 4,000 miles. Again, the curvature is not a problem for acoustics, as that should be a target hidden height of 1,669 miles. But the globe isn't a problem for them either. Isn't it amazing how evolution made sure that we can't find the curvature in any manner? Discovery number six, all beams wrap around the curvature. We just talked about sonar, but did you know that people doubted Guglielmo Marconi could send a radio transmission more than 200 miles because of the curvature of the Earth? To his credit, Marconi didn't believe these globe enthusiasts, and he was able to send a radio transmission across the Atlantic Ocean at a distance of 2,135 miles. In other words, according to the Glow Math, the distant Marconi antenna should have been hidden approximately 527 miles below the horizon. It was because of Marconi's achievement that the ionosphere theory was created to explain how Marconi's radio transmission was able to bounce back to Earth. A similar problem arose during World War II. The German Nikobine targeting system was used to enable German bombers to bomb targets in England. Essentially, two separate towers in Germany would transmit directed VHF radio waves towards England. The German bombers would fly along the first radio pathway and then would drop bombs where the second radio wave crossed the first path. Where the two radio waves crossed would be the bombing target location. This bombing system was highly accurate, enough where the Germans could bomb specific buildings. But the problem, even now, is that VHF beams do not supposedly bounce off of the ionosphere. Accordingly, the leading English government scientist said that such a targeting system was impossible due to the curvature of the Earth, and so lives were lost while the matter was continually investigated. It turns out the curvature wasn't a problem whatsoever, even though the German bombers should have been hidden well below the curvature. So far, we globe earthers don't have an answer to the Nicobine Flat Earth mystery, but we'll come up with something. In addition to the fact that laser, sonar, and VHF waves all wrap around the curvature to present a false flat Earth, the Loran Navigational Location System also mysteriously wrapped around the curvature. Amazingly, Loran radio waves could tell boats more than a thousand miles away exactly where the boat was located. Again, Loran was highly accurate over a thousand miles, even though the boat should have been hundreds of miles below the globe horizon. But for some reason, the geometric bulge was never a problem for Loran. Isn't it amazing how all beams just wrap around the curvature to present a false flat Earth? Mother Nature is awesome. Thank a flat Earther for bringing that to our attention. Discovery number seven, all craters on the moon are perpendicular. 
Again, until Flat Earth came around, I never thought about this. But all craters on the moon are perpendicular, coming in at 90 degrees. At first glance, that seems impossible under the official model because meteors should come in at all angles. Look at the moon's surface. Do you see any craters from a different angle? But it turns out that gravity is very special in that it always creates the same perpendicular crater, even on the Earth. Sure, it doesn't make any sense, but that's why we have gravity. It just fixes everything. It stops those meteors in their tracks and brings them straight down. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. Discovery number eight. The tides and the magic of gravity. Speaking of gravity, I never actually knew the official heliocentric story about how the gravity of the moon not only pulls the oceans towards the moon, but then pulls the earth ground, causing high tides on the opposite side of the earth. In other words, the Earth strangely bounces and creates high tides on the opposite side away from the Moon. Thanks to Flat Earthers, I had to look that all up. The Moon's here. It's pulling on the ocean at the top of the Earth, creating a high tide on the top. And on the bottom, another high tide is created because the Earth itself is pulled toward the Moon, even though the oceans down here have less gravitational pull exerted on them, being farthest away from the moon. So on the top and bottom, you have high tide because of the tidal bulges, and on the sides that are at right angles to the moon, you have low tide because the oceans stretch thin over the surface of the Earth. Pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, that is pretty crazy. It's hard to believe the Earth bounces to create a high tide away from the moon, but it must be real because the official sounding video says so. Sure, Flat Earthers point out that some places have four high tides, and the high tide doesn't have any relation to the position of the moon, and the fact that the moon's position should be easily detectable with modern high-precision scales, but the moon seems to have no gravitational effect on anything but the high tides and the non-detectable Earth bounce. Another amazing fact about gravity. Like refraction, it fixes everything, but yet eludes all actual testing. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. Discovery number nine, the Soviets never went to space. Of course, we know that NASA would never lie to us. But that doesn't mean the Soviets never lied. Unfortunately, the Soviets' lies were so good that NASA was never able to figure it out, and so there actually wasn't a space race. Look at this Soviet moon spaceship called Luna 16. I mean, who would ever think that this was fake? Well, I think it looks so ridiculous and impossible. Um, and you can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs> Elon is such a genius. I mean, who can argue with that logic? But here's that video of a former Soviet cosmonaut saying that they've never been to space. поредната хипотеза над която ще се наложи заедно с зрителите на въпрос на гледна точка да размишляваме дълго. Добре. Ето хорошо, когато Това е добре, когато хората мислят. Това ми харесва. Игор Петрович, благодаря ви за участието в въпрос на гледна точка. Моля. Discovery number 10. The mysterious Selenelian. We Globe supporters know that the lunar eclipse is one of our only arguments for a globe, but then those flat earthers started talking about the impossible red shadow color and how the supposed shadow often moves the wrong direction, moving from the top to the bottom, as explained by this confused individual. I find very interesting is I was expecting the shadow to come upward across the moon as it would go down and it would pass into shadow, and actually it's going the other way around. The shadow, as the moon is here, the shadow is creeping down across the moon, even though the sun's coming up over here, and that must be because of the moon's rotation around the Earth. But what really bothered me was when those annoying flat earthers started talking about selenelians. A selenelian is where there's a lunar eclipse when both the sun and the moon are above the horizon, like in this video. Geometrically speaking, there's no direct line of sight for the Earth's shadow to appear on the moon. Fortunately, Mother Nature fixes that too, because Mother Nature takes the Earth's shadow and bends it to fall on the moon. How amazing is that, especially since that only happens during a selenelian, 
Yes, the selling alien has been around for a long time, but because of flat earthers, we globe enthusiasts have had to rely on some pretty wild theories to maintain the globe and the heliocentric model. But wild, unprovable theories are okay and encouraged. Discovery number 11, space hair. This lady here is in an airplane that is nosediving in a parabolic arc to create a weightless environment. NASA even uses these airplanes constantly and to fake weightlessness in propaganda movies like Apollo 13. But notice that the woman's hair in the weightless environment flows naturally, like it's in a swimming pool. It's what we would expect. Now compare that hair in a true weightless environment with the hair of this astronaut woman in space. They're most certainly not the same. Of course, we know that NASA would never lie about space, and so we can logically conclude that NASA didn't deliberately sculpt the woman's hair into a Bride of Frankenstein style just so her hair looks spacey. No, NASA would never do that, and so the conclusion is that only in space can you get space hair like these astronauts. I wouldn't call that a huge discovery coming from flat earthers, but hey, I'm sure that hairstylists would like to debate space hair for many years, and maybe they'll be able to capture some space someday and give men and women these amazing hairdos back on Earth. You look like you're in a studio, maybe in Omaha, Nebraska or something. The, the, the shot is so clear. Is this a hoax? Are you really in space still? Is this a hoax? Are you really in space still? See the hair? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think Sandy's hair is pretty much a dead giveaway. <laughs> Discovery number 12. When did we get a green atmosphere? Whenever you watch a new video of space, you get this beautiful green atmosphere. It may look like a cartoon, but there's still no way they could fake something like this. Well, I think it looks so ridiculous and impossible. Um, and you can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs> but the Flat Earthers have raised a good question. Why didn't this beautiful green atmosphere exist during earlier space travels? I mean, look at these photos from earlier space missions, and there's no green atmosphere. Accordingly, the green atmosphere must be a recent phenomenon in the last decade or so. And so that makes for an, another interesting issue pointed out by flat earthers. I don't know what the explanation is, but I'm pretty sure that gravity and refraction fixes it. But now that I'm watching this SpaceX video again, not only is the green atmosphere missing, but also where are those 19,287 satellites? I keep looking through the SpaceX video and I don't see any sign of those 19,287 satellites. Aren't they supposed to be lit up like Christmas trees? I wonder how much SpaceX paid to have all of those 19,287 satellites in space relocated to the other side of the Earth. Hmm. Discovery number 13, the rising horizon. Here's Felix Baumgartner at roughly 10 feet above the ground. Here's Felix at 128,000 feet, and the horizon hasn't dropped one iota. Of course, on a globe, the horizon should not rise up with the observer, but it obviously has. So nature and millions of years of evolution have somehow made it so that the horizon rises up with the observer. Must be some new refraction abilities. In addition, look at that flat horizon. We used to think that you could see the curvature from airplanes, but that's simply not true. Now we globe supporters have to concede that you can't ever see the curvature unless you're in an official space agency, no matter how high you get up. Discovery number 14, Selective Coriolis. Felix Baumgartner brings me to one more point. It took Felix two and a half hours to get up to 128,000 feet. We had think that the rotation of the Earth at 1,040 miles per hour would somehow have an effect on the balloon. In fact... Felix should have roughly landed 2,000 miles to the west into the Pacific Ocean. Instead, Felix actually landed 44 miles to the east of his launch site. Of course, that doesn't make any sense under the globe model, but it turns out that we have a new phenomenon of nature to explain that away. As it turns out, Felix's balloon actually sped up to keep up with the ground below it, kind of like spokes on a bicycle wheel. And then he fell down right near where he started because Mother Nature somehow planned it that way so that the Earth would only appear motionless. It seems that the Coriolis effect only applies to field goal kickers, like Tyson says here, engine-driven Foucault pendulums, and toilets, but has no effect on anything else such as snipers, helicopter flights, east-west airplane flights, or even high-altitude balloons. 
In addition, no matter how much the Earth changes in varying motions, some extraordinary force makes it so that we can never feel or measure anything, even though the changes in movements should be perceptible and measurable. These are all new physics that have been discovered due to the Flat Earth Revolution. Discovery number 15, the wide-angle lens curvature. Of course, wide-angle fisheye lenses on cameras have been used for decades, but it took Flat Earthers to point out the fact that for some reason... Wide-angle lenses and curved windows are used to fake the curvature all of the time. Isn't it strange that all of these publications are using the obvious fisheye lens as proof of curvature? It took Flat Earthers to point out that Globe supporters were using this trickery when it's not entirely honest. But I guess I do understand the Globe position, because if you start from the infallible Globe presupposition, you can change the facts a little to maintain the original sacred premise. Sure, it's phony but it's called artistic license. So maybe I should take this one off of the list. Discovery number 16. No testing necessary for space travel. Look at this lunar lander. I know it looks ridiculous, but it's truly a marvelous spaceship that could drop from lunar orbit at 4,000 miles per hour and land on very rough, uniform colored, rock and crater infested terrain under poor light and viewing conditions. Then after three days of playing in the dust, even with a dune buggy that was somehow included in the trunk on later flights, the top part of this craft separated and blasted back into space to again rendezvous with the command module in orbit days later that was actually traveling at a mere 4,000 miles per hour. We know this Apollo 11 footage is real because NASA is included within our infallible presuppositions. But what's so amazing is the fact that the lunar lander was never actually flown on Earth. Ever. Not even once. It took moon landing deniers to point that out. No necessity to practice these crazy maneuvers of falling at 4,000 miles per hour and redocking at 4,000 miles per hour. You just need to fly a completely different aircraft a few hundred feet above a flat air base during the day and you're good. And still, three of these five alleged training vehicles crashed. But that wasn't a problem for NASA, because NASA and their astronauts are so smart that they don't actually have to test their vehicles that were going to be used in space in extreme circumstances. Here's more evidence of that. This is a time lapse of a Boeing aircraft being assembled. But do you know that there's not a single video or photograph of the ISS being assembled here on Earth? There was absolutely no testing of the ISS, fully assembled in a warehouse where teams of engineers could test everything, especially these unknown seals and valves that can last 20 years in an extreme environment. Normally, that would raise some eyebrows, but it's okay because astronauts are really smart and can just plug holes with their thumbs. That's some good old NASA ingenuity there. So, all of you engineers out there, you don't actually need to test your advanced aircraft as long as they go to space, as proven by NASA again and again. And if you ever spring a leak in a spaceship... You can always use your fingers to plug up any holes because the unbelievably powerful vacuum of space isn't really that dangerous after all. Discovery number 17. Airplanes automatically account for curvature. I find this flat earth discovery fascinating. Regardless of speed or altitude, airplanes automatically adjust for the curvature of the earth. Eight inches per mile squared, not a problem for any aircraft. These jets are automatically adjusting for the curvature every second. As another example, the SR-71 can fly at 2,193 miles per hour. That's 183 miles in just 5 minutes of flight. That would mean a curvature drop of approximately 22,000 feet in just 5 minutes of flight. Fortunately, gravity now has the property of making it so that the SR-71 nose continually dips downward to keep the SR-71 at the same altitude. We'd never know of this almost magical gravity property, but for those flat earthers raising all of those questions. Discovery number 18. Satellite balloons exist and are used often. Before Flat Earth, I never heard about NASA's repeated use of these high-altitude balloons for all types of purposes. These balloons can carry several tons of space equipment. This crashing satellite dangling from a balloon even included NASA telescopes. Apparently, all space agencies and many large corporations use these satellite balloons for purposes that we thought were limited to just space. Or maybe they just define space to include high-altitude balloons. Now that I mention it, I'm actually not sure why outer space satellites would even exist since these balloons are much cheaper. But I'm sure NASA has some reason, probably to use up that $62 million per day budget. Regardless, we know that we cannot doubt the existence of the 19,287 satellites in space. 
But thanks to Flat Earth, now I can cheer every time NASA launches a new space balloon. Discovery number 19. Satellite wires. Some satellites like this one, launched by the Challenger Space Shuttle, hang by wires. And that just must be necessary for space travel. Some Globe supporters have claimed that the wire is an antenna, but that's not correct because look at these NASA pictures of a similar satellite and it doesn't have an antenna. No, that must be a wire, but wires may be necessary to hold these satellites up in space. Another amazing discovery due to flat earthers asking questions. Discovery number 20, the scuba diver astronaut. We've all seen these videos what looks like bubbles from astronauts in space seeming to indicate that spacewalks are filmed in giant swimming pools. But of course we presuppose that our NASA priesthood never lies, and so those astronauts must be in space. But look at this reflection. It sure looks like a camera operator wearing scuba gear. But that can't be right. It must be some top-secret advanced black astronaut outfit that just happens to look like scuba gear. Or maybe there is water in space, and that's why this astronaut almost drowned. Discovery number 21. No pictures of the Earth from space. Before Flat Earth, I thought there were thousands of actual pictures of the Earth being taken from space all of the time. But it turns out, according to NASA, that there were no pictures of the Earth from space from 1972 through 2015. That's like 42 years without a photograph of the Earth from space. NASA says so in this article right here. Fortunately, during that time, NASA was able to create real-looking fake images of the Earth from space. Like this 2002 blue marble image of the Earth. This was created by this guy, Robert Simmon, by wrapping a flat map around a ball. According to Robert Simmon from NASA, Then we wrapped a flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface, clouds, and oceans to match people's expectations of how Earth looks from space. That ball became the famous blue marble. Who knew that flat maps can be wrapped around a ball, but that really seems deceptive. And that phony picture is hanging in classrooms everywhere. But it's okay that NASA faked it because it's more important that people see images of the Earth that were created to match your expectations of what the Earth looks like from space. It also shows us another great quality of NASA. They're really good at faking stuff. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. But I would add that Robert Simmons did forget that green atmosphere. I also find this interesting that there were no photographs of the Earth, entire Earth from space from 1972 until 2015. And the first photograph of the Earth after 42 years, which you're seeing right now, just happens to spell the word sex in the clouds. I just think that's a really cool coincidence. Discovery number 22, the professionals. Professionals who I would have thought would account for the coverage of the Earth actually never do. Airline pilots, military professionals, radar operators, gunners, missile operators, engineers, commercial surveyors, and many more all state that there is no accounting for the curvature or the Earth's rotation, and that's pretty amazing. It must be that the Earth flattens out for all the professionals as well. That's a pretty neat discovery due to flat earthers. Discovery number 23. The inverse square law of light does not apply to space. The inverse square law of light is simply not applicable to anything in space. Flat Earthers discovered that the moonlight on the moon's surface would be intensely blinding based on the official numbers of the heliocentric model. The inverse square law of light works like this. If you place a 100 lumen bulb in a floodlight that shines on only one square meter of surface, that surface will be lit at 100 lux. However, if you back the floodlight away to shine on four square meters, the surface is now lit with 25 lux the intensity of light is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. This means that as the distance from a light source increases, the intensity of light is equal to a value multiplied by 1 over d squared. The full moon, which is supposed to be reflecting sunlight, has an illuminance up to 1 lux on the Earth's surface. Look at this diagram and imagine that the light source is the moon and you're standing on the Earth's surface there on the bottom right corner. Each step higher you go, the moonlight gets more intense. So, based on the official distance to the moon and a one lux strength of moonlight on the Earth's surface, the Apollo astronauts would have experienced many thousands of times more illuminance on the moon's surface than direct sunlight on Earth. Every photo of the moon's surface would have been impossible and washed out. So this means that the inverse square law of light simply doesn't apply to anything in space. 
We globe earthers have had to rethink how the inverse square law works in order to keep believing in the moon landings and other claims about the vastness of space. These are new physics, resulting all from the points made by flat earthers. Discovery number 24, moonlight is cold. Repeated tests seem to indicate that moonlight is actually cool, meaning it's warmer in the shade of the moonlight, which contradicts the official model at this time. Here's a video from a non-flat earther demonstrating the same. What is up with that? I certainly don't understand it, but flat earthers seem to have gotten that one right. Discovery number 25, the closed continent. This is another fact that no one discussed until flat earthers came around. Antarctica is closed to all independent travel. The Antarctic Treaty, its handbook, and its enforcement protocols, which have remained inviolate for 60 years and includes signatories like the U.S., North Korea, China, and the former Soviet Union, essentially ban any reasonable attempt to explore below the 60th south parallel under the guise of protecting the environment. The amount of red tape and other shocking restrictions that you would have to jump through to independently visit Antarctica is impracticable, and they know it, and the borders of Antarctica are patrolled by all signatory nations. Of course, there are token visits along the ice shelf, and there are a few destination spots that you're not allowed to venture from, but that entire section of the world is literally off-limits to independent travel. This doesn't happen unless they're hiding something big from us. I find it fascinating that the entire world would cooperate over 60 years in keeping people out of Antarctica. Since the Earth isn't flat, the only reasonable explanation I can think of is that there must be an alien base in Antarctica, and that's why all of the governments are keeping us away. Discovery number 26. No north-south circumnavigation. Except for a few dubious claims, there is absolutely no north-south circumnavigation around the globe. That's a bit weird, don't you think? East-west circumnavigation is very possible on the flat Earth. But what isn't possible on the flat Earth is north-south circumnavigation. I didn't hear any of my globe-loving friends discuss this fact before flat Earthers figured it out. I don't know why airplanes avoid the shortest route by not flying over Antarctica, but I'm guessing it must be because of the aliens in Antarctica. We just can't have planes flying over alien bases, and that's why there is no north-south circumnavigation of the globe. Discovery number 27, no GPS in Antarctica. Coincidentally, as pointed out by Flat Earth, Banjo, USA, Japan, and Brazil, GPS does not work in Antarctica, even though that area under the globe should be equally covered by those 24 GPS space satellites. Of course, it makes perfect sense under the Flat Earth model, especially if balloons are involved, but I'm guessing alien technology must prevent GPS from working in Antarctica. Again, fascinating findings that stem from the Flat Earth community. Discovery number 28, same size sun and moon. This is footage from the recent solar eclipse in North America. It isn't really a Flat Earth discovery, but the Flat Earthers got us thinking about it. Notice that the sun and moon appear to be the same size during an eclipse? How's that possible? I know, I know, it's just an astronomical coincidence. Sure, there's probably one in a Googleplex chance of this, but we're just that lucky. Especially when you add in the one in a Googleplex chance that we even exist on the world to appreciate it. See, it's all just coincidence explained away by the massive size of the universe. But I'm grateful to the Flat Earthers to point out the fact that we're one of the lucky, but statistically impossible ones, to have a same-sized moon and sun in order to have this awesome view. Discovery number 29, the small moon shadow. Because of NASA, which would never lie, we know that the moon is supposed to have a diameter of 2,159 miles. But the shadow of the moon is only 70 miles across on the Earth's surface during a solar eclipse. Look at this image from a high-altitude balloon. The size of the moon shadow is small. It must be that the moon's shadow inexplicably shrinks to just 70 miles during a solar eclipse. Of course, that doesn't happen anywhere else, but space things are controlled by different physics that normally don't happen here on Earth. I don't think the Flat Earthers will ever understand that. Discovery number 30. Mechanical gyroscopes automatically adjust for the curvature. Super precision... Mechanical gyroscopes are supposed to retain rigidity in space, except somehow these same gyroscopes automatically adjust for both their curvature and axial rotation despite how many experiments are performed. In other words, you can take a mechanical gyroscope on board a jet, and the gyroscope will not exhibit drift for the curvature or axial rotation. These are new physics brought to our attention by Flat Earthers. Discovery number 31. The surface of the moon looks like a movie backdrop. 
The moon includes a strange vertical wall that looks strangely similar to a movie backdrop. Here, the backdrop appears to move and sway as the astronaut hops in front of it. The moon must have strange properties to look like a movie backdrop. Here, the astronauts look like they're dangling from wires, but that must be some strange moon flashes. Discovery number 32, flames are invisible in space. Here's another one from the moon landings. Look at the ascension stage of the lunar lander blast off from the moon. It looks pretty silly, but not only is NASA skilled enough to remotely operate the camera roughly 232,000 miles away to zoom out and tilt upward to follow the spaceship, the spaceship had no flame or light whatsoever. No light, no flame, no nothing. It must be this strange physics of the moon that are making it look fake. Discovery number 33, arcing space rockets. Space shuttles and other space rockets arc and appear to fall back down in order to get into orbit. Sure, the altimeter never shows this arc, but that must still be the way to get into space. And I think it's interesting how the rockets have to fall to go up. In addition to pointing out this weird attribute, Flat Earthers have also made us aware that no one actually knows why these rockets arc like that, as demonstrated by this parent here. Is that... This just makes me laugh because those kids are so dumb that they don't understand that the rocket only looks like it's falling because the earth is turning. I don't understand why these space rockets look like they're falling back into the ocean, but we do know that they're in space because look at this actual NASA video of a satellite. And those dumb flat earthers say there are no actual photographs and videos of satellites in space. <laughs> Boy, they're wrong. Well, I think it looks so ridiculous and impossible. Um, and you can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs> Discovery number 34. Columbus didn't get the memo. For some reason, there were no globes since 1492, even though everyone supposedly knew it was a globe for thousands of years. That is to say, ever since the time of the semi-fictional character known as Eratosthenes, who measured the size of the globe, Earth, based on hearsay claims of shadows in a well hundreds of miles away, interestingly, no one thought it worthwhile to actually create a globe for thousands of years, showing all the hidden areas of the globe with the circumference that Eratosthenes supposedly measured. But what I also find interesting is the historical fact that Columbus must have been a piss-poor navigator, because he should have known that he was 9,000 miles short of the Indian Ocean. Why in the world did Columbus think he landed near India when everyone knew the size and shape of the Earth? That's a pretty interesting historical discovery brought to our attention by the Flat Earthers. I think we'll have to fix Wikipedia again. Discovery number 35, the vacuum of space is amazing. According to the heliocentric model, the Earth's atmosphere is adjacent to a nearly endless and extremely powerful vacuum, and yet we're still alive because the vacuum has no effect on our atmosphere. Space just happens to be the only place you can find a pressurized atmosphere without a container, and gravity, inexplicably, knows how to selectively protect us from certain death. Experiments like this one show that gravity cannot hold a gas in place when a vacuum is above it, but we're talking about space. Whole or vacui simply doesn't apply to space. Another amazing discovery resulting from flat Earth questions. 
Discovery number 36, the Challenger astronauts are okay. I always thought it was a little coincidental that the only time in elementary school that we ever watched a rocket launch was the day when one blew up. That was heart-wrenching for my entire classroom, as some children were even crying. But it turns out, thanks to Flat Earth investigators, that most of the Challenger astronauts seem to be alive and well. Discovery number 37, Devon Island in Canada looks just like Mars. This was a great find by Jaronism, who seemingly brought it to everyone's attention that Devon Island, off the coast of Canada, looks just like Mars. Devon Island just needs a reddish tint to it, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Even NASA representatives say the same. What's even more amazing is the fact that NASA has a rover on Devon Island that looks just like the Mars rover. NASA coincidentally found a near-exact replica of Mars to practice driving a rover with a camera. Of course, since we know that NASA would never fake anything and it's all just coincidence, I find it all fascinating. But I never heard of Devon Island until Flat Earth came around, and now I just hope to visit Devon Island because I'm such a NASA fanboy. Discovery number 38, the flying solar system glued together by gravity. The entire solar system and all its comets, planets, moons, and meteors and everything else are tied together with gravity rubber bands that hold it all together as it rockets through space. In some way, all the planets and their moons maintain the same level plane as they chase after the rocketing sun. None of it makes any sense, but I'm sure gravity somehow rigidly holds everything on the same plane and can help comets find their way back to our rocketing solar system. In addition, do you ever wonder why all of these objects in our solar system don't leave tails like comets? I know, I know, I shouldn't ask these type of questions. Discovery number 39, glitches in space. It does appear as though there are some very strange glitches in space. Look at all of these astronauts glitch out, but the background roughly remains. It seems to be a layer of CGI. Look at this astronaut appear to grab nothing and set nothing down. Look at this strange glitch where the coffee color separates from the bag leaving a clear bag. Look at this lemon appear through the hand of the astronaut. Of course, the flat earthers use this as evidence that they're faking space, but since we know that NASA never fakes space, since our unquestioning faith tells us so, these must all be proofs that space causes strange glitches in the camera that only appear as though they're faking space. Another amazing discovery resulting from flat earthers and their questions. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. Discovery number 40. The ISS model. When you watch this video, supposedly shot from a Soyuz spaceship, the ISS really does appear to look like a silly model. Even with my solid globe faith, it's difficult for me to say that this is anything but a model. I think that once in a while, space has to be faked in order to get better photos of things that are actually happening in space. It's only a model. So, they used a model ISS as the real ISS. That's okay. Fakery is good so long as it increases everyone's faith in the globe and our heliocentric religion. Flat Earthers need to realize that faking space does not mean that space is fake. It only means that sometimes space agencies use trickery to help us see space better. You just need to learn these techniques of doublethink. I think I have presented a compelling case that nature is hell-bent on tricking us that we live on a flat Earth. Why is that? I don't know. But we must thank the Flat Earthers for bringing this puzzling fact to the forefront. For example, the Earth's curvature cannot be detected because the globe bulge strangely disappears and reappears to present a false flat Earth. You can't see the curvature from 128,000 feet up, and the horizon impossibly rises with the observer. Lasers, radar, sonar, radio waves, VHF waves, nothing will evince the curvature of the Earth as all beams ignore curvature. Airplanes and gyroscopes automatically adjust for the curvature to present a false flat Earth. Professionals, including commercial surveyors and military personnel, never account for the curvature or the Earth's rotation in any manner, even though you think they would. The very motions of the Earth cannot be detected, measured, or felt because nature inexplicably prevents that from happening except with respect to field goals and Foucault pendulums. The vacuum of space should remove the Earth's atmosphere in a heartbeat, but nature prevents that too through the mysterious and selective force of gravity. Nature's flat Earth schemes are absolutely amazing. Of course, we need to still call Flat Earthers names and censor them on all media platforms like YouTube because we can't let anyone challenge our circular logic and the presupposition that we live on a ball, twirling and vortexing through the vacuum of space. 
But we globe apologists should be secretly thanking flat earthers behind closed doors for forcing us to invent implausible physics and explanations to fight the flat earth. Now, that should keep YouTube from deleting my channel again. Thank you for watching.